Hello everyone, Victor is here, your guide to all things organic chemistry, and in this video I want to talk about the synthesis of cyclopropane carboxylic acid this guy over here. This might seem like a very simple molecule, yet it is a little bit of a synthetic challenge and it is a very important starting material for quite a few different synthetic procedures, including natural molecules. And because this molecule is a little bit of a challenge to synthesize, instructors love to add that to the exams, so let's go over the synthesis and look at two different procedures. I want to first look at the classic 1944 procedure that has been published in Organic Synthesis and a more modern approach via the malonic ester synthesis, which is going to be the synthetic procedure which your instructor will expect if, let's say, we see this reaction on the final exam. So, the classic synthesis of the cyclopropane carboxylic acid, as it was described in 1944 publication in Organic Synthesis, starts by treating this nitrile with a rather concentrated solution of sodium hydroxide and high heat. As a matter of fact, if you look at the original article from 1944, the original article takes takes the liquid nitrile and adds the solid sodium hydroxide to it. Well, actually, it's the other way around. We take a sample of the sodium hydroxide and add the liquid uh, nitrile on top of that, and reaction is done neat without any solvent altogether. But there are some versions in the literature that does use a little bit of water as a solvent there as well, so you can do this reaction either neat or in the presence of the solvent. So the first thing that's going to happen here in this reaction is going to be the acid-base chemistry between our sodium hydroxide and the hydrogens that we have over here in the alpha position to our nitrile. So I'm going to show that my hydroxide comes in and pulls one of those protons off, giving me the following enolate-like structure, which of course can be stabilized by resonance, and that's the whole point why it even forms in the first place, and our resonance structure here will look like this. Now, at this point you might be wondering why we are not seeing any SN2 reactions, and why no direct attack on our nitrile by the hydroxide. Well, the last question here is fairly easy to answer. The thing is, nitriles are not particularly particularly electrophilic, and that reaction is a little bit slow, so if we have anything else that can potentially happen in our reaction, the other processes will be just a little bit faster. When it comes to the first question, why there is no SN2 attack from our hydroxide and the electrophilic carbon where the chlorine is sitting, well, the answer here is frankly, well, the same. That reaction is also slower than the acid-base chemistry, so we don't really have much chance of the SN2 happening there before the acid base going to occur. And you might want to argue back here that while the acid-base chemistry is incredibly fast, the equilibrium constant here is going to be really bad. The pKa of nitriles is something like, what, 25? So our equilibrium constant here is going to be something like 10 to the negative 9, which is a ridiculously small number. And yes, you would be absolutely correct here, the equilibrium is not in our favor. But here is something really interesting. As soon as we have our nucleophile over here, now we have a chance of the intramolecular reaction. So what I can do here is to do the intramolecular SN2 attack on the carbon with the chlorine like so, giving me cyclization into a three-membered ring. And here is the kicker. The intramolecular SN2 reactions are incredibly fast. So in this case, as soon as we form our nucleophile, it will immediately close into a three-membered ring without the chance of going back, which means that although the equilibrium leading towards the formation of the nucleophile is not particularly good, as soon as we form that, we are taking that nucleophile out of equilibrium immediately by closing that into a three-membered ring. And that step, this one right over here, is a non-equilibrium step. Once you get there, there is no coming back. So essentially, this step becomes the driving force for this reaction, and because of that we are not seeing much of the other chemistry competing with this process. Now, since this reaction is done at very harsh conditions, sodium hydroxide that we have here in this reaction is taking in excess, and it is going to be partially hydrolyzing our nitrile as we go. However, the procedure requires the aqueous workup and and the hydrolysis of our nitrile in uh, diluted sulfuric acid. So the next step that we are going to have in the synthesis is going to be the hydrolysis of the nitrile in sulfuric acid in aqueous conditions, giving us our carboxylic acid. And according to the originally published and 
and checked procedure, this sequence gives us about 74 to 79% yield, which is not excellent, but it is still a very good yield. Now, as I've mentioned at the beginning of this video, we are also going to be looking at the synthesis of our cyclopropane carboxylic acid via the malonic ester synthesis approach. And that is, as I said, is something that your instructor is going to expect on the exam if you are going to see something like that, you know, on your homework, exam, or a quiz. So, for the malonic ester synthesis, we are typically going to start with the diethyl or maybe dimethyl malonate, which is a very good starting point for a lot of enol and enolate chemistry, because the PKA of the protons that we have in the middle in between those two carbonyls is fairly low. The PKA of those protons is around 13, which means that they can be easily removed even with a mild base. And the mild base that we are going to be using in this case is usually going to be something like sodium or potassium ethoxide. The counter ion, whether it's sodium or potassium, doesn't really matter for our purposes. So what this base is going to do, it's going to come in and pull one of those protons off, forming a nucleophile like in the previous case, in this case we are going to be forming a very much classic enolate looking like this, and of course we are going to have a few resonance structures here which I am not going to be showing. If you want to practice, I suggest you draw those resonance structures. You should see two more resonance structures with a negative charge on this carbon and the negative charge on this oxygen. But coming back to my enolate here, we know that enolates are excellent nucleophiles and they can do easily different types of substitution reactions, including substitution reactions with alkyl halides. So if I here use an appropriate alkyl halide, I can potentially assemble my three-membered ring. The alkyl halide that I would have to use in this case is actually a dihalide, because we need to make two carbon-carbon bonds, and overall we have two carbons in our molecule over here that I'm bringing in, carbons one and two. In the first step of this reaction, my enolate is going to react with one of those electrophilic positions doesn't matter which we choose, the molecule is completely symmetrical, giving me the following intermediate. Now, here, in order for us to make the second carbon-carbon bond between this carbon and this carbon, we need to reform our enolate again. So, I'm going to bring my ethoxide back, take this hydrogen, and I'm going to remove that one, reforming my enolate, which would look like this with all of the other resonance structures that we can draw for that. And here we are going to have the same deal like in the previous reaction where the acid base is going to happen faster than uh, the nucleophilic attack on the electrophilic carbon with the chlorine, so we would expect the formation of the enolate to be much faster than the uh, nucleophilic attack from the oxygen onto our carbon displacing the chlorine. That doesn't happen much. But again, just like in the previous case, as soon as we form our enolate, the intramolecular reactions are going to do their magic and immediately close up our molecule into a three-membered ring, looking like this. So, we've got our three-membered ring. What next? We need to get rid of one of the carbonyls somehow, and that can be easily accomplished by the decarboxylation reaction, but in order to do the decarboxylation, we first need to hydrolyze our molecule into the carboxylic acid. This hydrolysis is typically done as a two-step process. First, we are going to do the saponification reaction to convert our ester into the corresponding carboxylate, and then we are going to neutralize it to give us the carboxylic acid. Once we have a 1,3-dicarboxylic acid, the malonic acid itself, those guys are typically quite unstable, so once we introduce a little bit heat, we are going to undergo the spontaneous decarboxylation reaction. So once I have my carboxylic acid like that, we can do this goes here, this goes here, this goes here, giving me the enol form of my carboxylic acid, of my final product, so the last thing for us to do is going to do just the keto enol tautomerism, which happens automatically on its own, and since I'm running out of space here, I'm not going to draw the mechanism for that, but that's going to give us our carboxylic acid. So now, when you see the synthesis on your exam or maybe a homework, you'll know how to deal with that, and you'll be able to do the synthesis without any problems. And as always, thank Thank you for watching. If you like this video, give it thumbs up. If you hated it, give it thumbs down. Subscribe to the channel for more organic chemistry tutorials and updates. Watch this video next, and I will see you next time.